Welcome to Horror Study Hall, the academic side of horror. I'm your host, M.A. Reynolds. It's time to get spooky. Hey, welcome to Horror Study Hall. Uh, today we are talking with Matthias Clayson, um, PhD, the, a professor, author of Why Horror Seduces, A Very Nervous Person's Guide to Horror Movies, among many other articles and studies. He is also the director of the Recreational Fear Lab at Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to come on my podcast today. You're my very first interview for my podcast, and I can be more excited. That's a huge honor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't remember exactly how I came across the Recreational Fear Lab. Um, I, I do a lot of random Google searches, just trying to gather more information about horror studies and why we like horror. And somehow I came across um, the lab and I got really excited about it. I feel like there's a ton of really cool studies going on there. Um, I follow on social media and, and just kind of stay in touch. And I, my goal is just to kind of bring more attention to the work that you and your teammates are doing over there and just talk about horror studies in general. Um, so thanks again. Sounds awesome. Um, so just for a little bit of background information on you, um, can you tell mm -hmm. me how you became interested in the subject of studying horror? Yeah, uh, that's a story that exists in a number of versions. Um, with regards to length anyway. So there's a short story, a long one and a medium, um, but I can try to go for the medium. Perfect. Length. Yeah. Um, so for me, there's a question of when it begins. I mean, my professional interest in scary media and horror and other forms of recreational fear, it really grows out of personal fascination. And so I've been fortunate enough and stubborn enough to be able to channel that personal fascination into a viable career. And I'm grateful every day. Um, but but really, it, it grows out of, you know, wondering about what the hell is going on when people voluntarily seek out entertainment that is, you know, specifically designed to evoke negative emotions. So So people flock to movie theaters and they scream in terror. Usually the scream of terror is, is followed by, you know, laughter or um, chuckles of appreciation or whatever. So it's not only negative emotion, but it is negative emotion that defines the genre and that, you know, the horror itself is a is an emotional state. Um, so that was always weird to me, uh, not least because I was sort of a scaredy cat when I was a boy. Um, I remember taking a book out from the library a book of ghost stories and it scared me so badly like i would check under the bed for weeks before going to sleep i would look over my shoulder when i was alone to see if any you know undead creature was standing behind me waiting to yank out my spine and drink the fluids coming out of that severed spine and and th but then something happened in my teenage years where that kind of very negative response to scary stories gradually turned into something more ambivalent which gradually became something that was dominated by pleasure so suddenly i started deriving a lot of joy out of reading stephen king or poe or lovecraft or watching slasher movies from the 80s or whatever so uh, so it's a fairly common trajectory uh, that children find uh, horror stories kind of too scary they're still drawn to it i mean there's a very natural attraction to to frightening media and monster stories and so on. Uh, and then in the teenage years, 
um, they tend to, to to become more and more interested and um, and seek it out voluntarily. So that's what it was like for me. And and the thing that really kicked it off for me was a it was the stand, which is a miniseries. Oh yeah, uh, based, yeah. They filmed that so, here where I live. I remember when I was a teenager, um, they were filming it in my hometown. The scene okay. with uh, Rob Lowe and when he yeah. was the special needs gentleman. Yeah. That's um, my hometown <laughs> in Utah. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, that was that that really made a huge impression. That was the first kind of horror that for me was an unequivocal joy it really kind of opened a new realm to me i started thinking about what what can this stuff do that no other genre can do and um so i just you know it was a friend of mine who got this stand on laser disc back when that was a thing and we saw that whole miniseries during one day and then i ran out almost literally immediately afterward and bought everything of stephen king i could get my hands on oh that's awesome that's awesome the stand is is definitely one of my all-time favorites as well um for me what um, what is your all-time favorite oh gosh it changes so Mm. um i've from for as long as i can remember i've always been in love with horror unfortunately i had parents that weren't so so great and just let us watch whatever we wanted and when i was seven years old my mom took me to see hellraiser in the theater which is not a movie you take a seven-year-old to <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> and it's just I've, i just always remember always being drawn to it it was a, a way to escape the horrors of my everyday life because i had a little more troubling um upbringing um And whenever I have like negative emotions and I'm watching horror, those negative emotions tend to come out of me and just get put inside the horror. And so I'm no longer feeling those negative emotions. It's like, oh, like if someone goes for a run, they feel better when they're feeling a Mm. little upset. I watch a horror movie. Say I have the same effect. Um, So I guess one of the the first ones I can remember really loving would be uh, Fright Night, one of Mm -hmm. my all time favorites and The Gate. Um, Mm -hmm. with a very young Stephen Dwarf. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I thought those claymation demons were just so cute. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. And so it's interesting to hear that you weren't um, as um, interested in horror when you were very small, but then you grew into it. Um, Was there anything that maybe triggered that transition for you or it was just growing up, just becoming more mature? I think... Yeah, growing up, becoming more mature, and also coming across the right uh, oh, yeah. stimulus. Yeah, yeah. I think because I had some bad experience. Like, remember vividly, I was uh, fourteen, I think, and my friends sort of uh, peer pressured me into watching um, Sleepwalkers. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, which which funnily enough is also a Mick Garris movie, same as the Stan miniseries, but. That was so frightening to me. I had to leave halfway through. And that, that was a huge loss of face for me. Um, and that kind of turned me off for a couple of years. And then, but then I saw the stand and that was, it was so full of, it was so much more than just grisly dismemberment and jump scares. And it was full of compassion. And Humanity. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Insight into the human condition, that sort of thing. I, I agree with that. I, I've talked to many people who tell me they don't like horror. And it's like, well, you just haven't find the right kind because I agree with it's that. a yeah. huge spectrum. So a sh- movie like Martyrs, which I saw and I will never watch again because it was very traumatic. Great movie. I will never watch that again compared to something like a creature feature like um, yeah. Killer Sofa is a really ridiculous one that I absolutely <laughs> love. It's It's a killer mm-hmm. chair. <laughs> right. so it's like there's a whole spectrum and and many stories to be told um through the yes. use of horror yeah. um so what led you to the recreational fear lab and your work that you're doing today um it's been a long journey uh and it really is a dream come true um, because my own background is so i did a, a degree in english uh, and i did my phd in english on trying to construct what i called a biocultural framework for horror so trying to um to look at evolutionary psychology and cognitive science to see if if there was any kind of insight into why people like to play with fear uh uh, read horror novels play horror video games and so on um but i was always really interested in sort of doing more empirical work you know data collection going out into the real world and measuring things 
but I don't myself have, have that sort of training. So there was a period of, of uh, establishing uh, collaborative relationships, finding colleagues who had the skills that I myself lacked, and then getting funding. You know, that was a huge struggle. Uh, but finally, we did strike gold and got a very substantial grant, about half a million dollars to establish the lab and, and do research. And so, um, again, it's... It's really, it, it really luck and stubbornness is, is <laughs> are the main ingredients. Um, so that's where we are today. We now have the Recreational Fear Lab. It's what, two and a half years old. Uh, and we've done a lot of fun things and have a lot of fun things lined up for the future. Yeah, something um, I, I noticed in the lab, I think last year sometime there was an online uh, conference that the lab put on that I kind of shoehorned myself into and I did watch part of it. <laughs> and I, I remember seeing a tour of the lab and there were VR machines and all, all kinds of really cool equipment you use in your studies. Um, aside from the VR machine, um, what, what, what other methods do you use in your research? Yeah, so we have like two main tracks, uh, I guess you could say. And one track is lab studies. So studies that we conduct in the lab and the other track is uh, field studies, so where we go into the world and um, and collect data. And the, I guess also there's a third track, which is doing, for example, survey studies. Yeah, so, so we've done a bunch of survey studies. Some of them are really cool. Uh, we did one during uh, the first lockdown during COVID, where we wanted to know if people who watch many horror movies had better psychological resilience, whether whether they exhibited fewer symptoms of, of stress during the lockdown. And we did find such an effect. And we think it's it's a result of people having a lot of practice in the fine art of emotion regulation. So people who watch horror movies practice their ability to keep fear at a tolerable level. That's something we know from other research that we've done that somebody who seeks out horror is actually very actively engaged in regulating their own response using a variety of, of strategies. Um, so that study, which really got a lot of traction and went around the globe and was tweeted about by Heather Langenkamp herself. That I remember reading that paper. study. It was fascinating. <laughs> it made complete sense to me, someone who watches mm -hmm. horror. Yeah, that's it. For some people, it just confirmed an intuition they had. Uh, but for people who you know have that kind of impoverished understanding of horror as torture porn or jump scare fests or whatever. I think it was a bit of an eye opener. Uh, but that's one example of a survey study. Uh, we have other such studies, uh, uh, including a very big, ambitious attempt to um, to kind of look at the landscape of recreational fear among Danish children. So we're oh, looking at, okay. yeah, the, so this is kids aged one to 17. And we're trying to get a picture of what do they do to play with fear? What does a one-year-old do? Uh, what does a 17-year-old do? Uh, where where do they do it? With whom do they do it? So we identified a, a bunch of different uh, categories of recreational fear, which we define as you know playing with fear, seeking out situations that frighten you, but that you also find enjoyable. Wow, and, that, um, that sounds incredible and very interesting. I'm looking forward to at least, especially seeing uh, the small children, what, what yeah. they do. Teenagers probably video games but you never know yeah yes certainly <laughs> video games and that's actually one domain in which there's a big gender difference oh yeah uh, yeah um it's not the gender difference isn't really what people used to think it was with horror uh used to be thought that it was a you know male teenagers watching slasher movies and that is not the case um it's actually fairly evenly divided uh, but with horror video games that is a teenage boy thing more much more so than than a girl thing but for the very for the small kids, I mean, some of the first playful activities that we expose kids to have an element of horror, and it begins with the uh, the baby jump scare, uh, also known as peekaboo, or you know throwing kids into the air and catching them again, uh, or chasing them while pretending to be a monster. I mean, those are all um, examples of recreational fear that kids tend to find really pleasurable. I never thought of it that way. That. Yeah, when you are playing peekaboo or tossing your child, they usually do have a look of horror on their face until you catch them, and then they're giggling and having a great time. Wow, exactly. That's, that's really interesting. 
it's not that different from adults going to a haunted house and being chased by a guy with a chainsaw and then you know screaming in terror and then laughing uh and that's you know that's that's one of the fun things about this research is that we've come to realize that horror is just kind of one country on 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 the continent of recreational fear uh, that there are so many different human activities that are really defined by that fearful component um so even people who say they don't like horror usually they will enjoy some other recreational fear activity yeah, like roller like, coasters exactly roller yeah. coasters uh dark tourism mm -hmm. uh true crime podcasts oh uh, yeah that's whatever. super popular yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so um so, so that's that's an example of a survey study where we interviewed 1600 parents um then we have the lab studies where for example we might put people in front of our uh we have the big screen television and we might equip people with physiological sensors to look at fear response uh, when they are exposed to a jump scare. Um, so for example, we had a fun little kind of pilot study, uh, my colleague Thomas Turkelson and I, where we were visited in the lab by a journalist who wanted to do some coverage of our work. And he had stayed clear of horror his entire life. He really wanted to avoid that. But he um, agreed to, to watch the opening scenes of Lights Out with me and we equipped him and me with um with uh psychophysiological measuring devices so measuring uh, skin conductance how much are you sweating because that is uh, uh that is one way to measure arousal including fear and then we watched those opening scenes and there were a couple of really good jump scares and it was interesting to see how his response and my response were different so we both responded to the jump scare with a huge peak in GSR, in galvanic skin response. Uh, but but for the non-jump scary scenes, I sort of flatlined, you know, in terms of physiological arousal, whereas his arousal was all over the place. He was really almost losing it. And we could measure that. Um, and then we have the VR stuff. Um, so, so those will be examples of lab studies. And then finally, the field studies, which we've been doing since 2016, in a really awesome collaboration with the scariest haunted house in Denmark. It's called Dystopia Haunted House. They have a, a, a haunt, you know, inspired by the American Halloween tradition of visiting haunted attractions in October. So they have this big old abandoned factory in the middle of the woods uh, that each Halloween is converted into a immersive horror show. And we've been coming every Halloween to collect data for seven years now. So, uh, so that's one of the high points, but also one of the most stressful points of the year is doing empirical horror recreational fear research at a haunted attraction. Oh, I'm sure it keeps you extremely busy during the month of October. Yeah, because that's also where all the journalists want uh, to, you know, they're, they're doing stories about why do people like horror and why is Halloween so popular? So it's, it's really, you know, yeah. Busy times, but fun times. Have you found any um, any data or anything interesting about how people experience horror in groups, or is that something that your lab isn't currently looking into? Yeah, that's an excellent question because it is one aspect of horror and certain other kinds of recreational fear that's at least research wise a little bit overlooked. But, you know, if you look into the world, most horror experiences are social at their very core. Um, almost nobody watches horror movies alone. Almost nobody goes to a haunted house alone. Uh, even playing horror video games, people tend to do it with others or they communicate with others. Uh, there is one exception, that is reading horror literature. But but that is a historical novelty. It's That's only the solitary enjoyment of a literary text has only been around for a couple of hundred years so for for literally thousands of years before then before widespread literacy and the printing press and so on uh, stories would be shared verbally in groups you know the tribe would get together somebody would tell a scary story maybe making sound effects or creating a little bit of a, a jump scare that's what it was like for thousands of years so um so yes we actually have some data that we're currently writing up uh, 
from a haunted house study conducted at Dystopia Haunted House where we wanted to know what it does to the experience to um, to experience horror with people you feel close to emotionally as opposed to people that you don't know. Because at, at, the, at this particular haunted house, and I think that's probably the same in, in, in many American haunted houses, they, they construct these groups of four or five people. Okay, so that's the same. So if I arrive with my wife, we'll probably be put into a group with another couple, right? So, um, so we thought, let's see if we can measure physiological arousal. So we equipped participants with these lightweight heart rate monitors. And we asked them about the nature of their relationship with the other members of the group, somebody they knew, somebody they felt very close to, or somebody they didn't know. And as it turns out, and this is really maybe surprising, it turns out that people um, synchronize physiologically with other group members that they feel emotionally close to. And, 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 and the really cool thing is, that physiological synchronization, the fact that their heart rates kind of follow each other over the 50 minutes of the haunt, that synchronization leads to increased arousal. So they actually get a stronger um, response than people who are experiences, experiencing the haunt with strangers. And, and we think it's a, we don't know what the mechanism is here. Um, it could be that you're not as inhibited if you're with somebody that you trust. It could be that you mirror each other's arousal in a kind of reinforcing feedback loop. It could be a kind of constructive resonance. Um, the very fact that experiencing something together enhances the experience. It's always more fun to do things with. Oh, yeah. Others. Yeah. Who yeah. wants to go on a roller coaster by themselves? And exactly. Go to a That'll be weird. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of my, my favorite, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my favorite memories, I took my daughter and her friend to a haunted house and they opted to let the actors touch them. And I don't ever do that because I don't like strangers touching me. It's, it's just a thing. <laughs> and Pennywise came out of the well and he starts dragging my daughter's friend and they're both crying. And I'm just laughing hysterically. It was the funniest. <laughs> I wish I could have taped it. It was the funniest thing yeah. I've ever seen them clinging onto each other for life and just crying. And it's it kind of is, it goes to your study there and the results. It, it is way mm. more fun. And even if you're not scared, watching your friends yeah. or your family members get scared can be super funny. Um, when it Paranormal can. Activity came out, I my favorite yeah. thing to do was to watch it with someone who had never seen it mm -hmm. and just watch them react to it. It was, I wasn't yes. watching the movie. I was just watching them and having yeah. a great time. Right. Yeah, that and that that is one peculiar pleasure of, of horror that that has not yet really been researched. Um, and we thought about doing something, not at least, uh, you know, we've been puzzled about the volunteers at that haunted attraction. What do they get out of it? You know, they spend night after night with no pay, just their their pay is, you know, the terrified screams of the customers. Why is it so much fun to scare somebody else? You know, the pleasure of the, of the prank. Um, so, so that's something we don't know a lot about, but we are beginning to see if we can understand the kind of social dynamics of horror. Oh, that Which would be great. To be crucial. Yeah. Yeah. It really gives you an insight into our minds and how we bond together as humans. It's yeah. Super yeah. cool. Yeah. And, and, and you, you mentioned you used the word bond. And I think this is not something we can say kind of scientifically yet. But right. Anecdotally, at least, there, there certainly seems to be a bonding effect. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's no coincidence that teenagers often have horror movie film nights you know they scream together they bond together they have a very powerful experience to share and they feel they made it together uh, i remember a couple of years ago i was in uh, in china to guest teach in beijing and my host took me to a chinese haunt even in china they now have haunted houses and one of those haunted houses had a slogan that translated to english went um you come as strangers and leave as friends and I thought that was spot on. You know, we see this at the haunted house all the time. And people coming and it's a little bit awkward to be put in a group with somebody you don't know. But once they emerge more or less unscathed on the other side, they're chatting like they've been friends for years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's that's super interesting. Uh, what has been one of the more surprising things you've learned from your research? Um, we were surprised by by that uh, boosting effect of... of uh, 
because th there had been at least in the in the in the fear literature this assumption that you know if you're with somebody else it acts as a kind of buffer it's a way to to keep fear down but turns out it can also be a catalyst for a physiological arousal um, there was another fun study we did also in the haunted house uh, this one was uh, led by my colleague mark melndorf arneson um, and in this study we wanted to look at the relationship between fear and enjoyment because that's what you know is at the heart of, of horror you have to be scared and it has to be pleasurable and um, and we sort of had this idea that maybe if we measure fear and enjoyment, we might find a linear relationship so that the scarier, the better. That's certainly the the impression you would get from, from the marketing campaigns of horror movies. Like you mentioned Paranormal Activity just before. And that, the famous trailer for the first one, which kind of turned the camera around and showed you the audience and their screams of terror and jumping around in their seats and covering their eyes was sort of a seal of approval or you know evidence of quality if you mm -hmm. want to if you, if you want to be as uncomfortable as these poor people buy a ticket <laughs> and we did <laughs> and, 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 exactly we did challenge accepted yes <laughs> um but but actually we didn't find a linear relationship uh we find what what is known as a as an inverted u-shaped relationship so if you imagine a sort of coordinate system um it's not a straight line that goes up so that fear increases with enjoyment or vice versa it's more like a rainbow uh, if people see out a horror movie and it's not scary at all it's boring they'll be disappointed whereas if it's too frightening if fear is too high it will also be unattractive yeah and that I think makes there, sense yeah i think there are there are many historical examples like you remember the stories about when the exorcist came out yeah. <laughs> uh, just after christmas in 73 how people would faint and they would you know run out of the movie theater and i think that 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 fell outside what we have come to call the sweet spot of fear so that that middle range on the rainbow where uh pleasure is maximized and fear is at a just so level i think for me personally it's when it becomes too real it's no longer mm -hmm. fun um, so I don't know if it's a correlation between recreational fear and real world fear, um, yeah. but I don't know. Um, the more real something is, the less likely I'm going to enjoy it. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. See, and that's where that's where horror very often tries to get us, because um, there is a concept from psychology called psychological distance, which is a measure of how close something feels to us. And um and horror movies are always trying to reduce psychological distance to make us forget that it's fiction. You know, it's in the very na the, the way movies are edited. You're not supposed to see the cuts. Um, you're supposed to kind of just be immersed and decoded as reality, as looking through a window into this really scary world. And very often, horror movies will claim to be based on real events. Right. Or they will, you know, the found footage stuff, uh, Blair Witch Project, or indeed um, Paranormal Activity, as a way to make it seem more real. So that's what horror movie directors are trying to do, push it close to us. And we're trying to do the opposite, to to uphold a little bit of distance so it doesn't get too close. There is a very sweet spot there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, but, and that goes way back. I mean, Dracula, the novel from 1897. That's also almost like plain. a found footage novel, just the way it's totally. written. Exactly. In the epistolary format with the news clippings and diary entries. And that is old school literary found footage. I, I saw a company that had turned it into like an, a found footage experience where they took um, the clip, the writings of, I can't remember the doctor's name, the, the so asylum doctor yes and they actually put it on yeah. a record all of his stuff is on a record and the newspaper uh, clippings are actually on newspaper clippings and so they just wow. took it and reproduced it in the real life it's like one of these things i really really want but mm -hmm. i can't justify spending the money on it <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really cool, though. it is super super cool i'll email it to you yeah. if you're interested because yeah. i really Thanks. want it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, do you do any research into real world fear versus recreational fear? Or is your research 100% focused on why we enjoy fear as a recreational activity? Yeah, I think what, what I'm really interested in is recreational fear. Yeah. But the fear we measure is real fear. 
Right. Um, All fear is real fear. We're feeling it. It's valid. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But I'm, I'm not very interested in fear, fear. Yeah. Uh, it really, you know, you get uh, as a researcher, you get more and more kind of n- narrowed in on, on whatever topic you're, you're studying and, but at the same time, you know, I, I mentioned before how we've kind of expanded the category from from horror to recreational fear, which, which turns out to really saturate human lives. Yeah. Uh, but what what we what I and my my team is interested in is really when fear is fun. You know, mm-hmm. when people are playing with it. But there is, but there is, I guess, a sliding into real fear when you kind of go over that sweet spot. Um, if you're watching a horror movie that's too scary, or if you uh, wander into an extreme haunt, and that's what not what you were bargaining for. Or the roller coaster is too wild, and you find yourself facing death. <laughs> then the pleasure sort of goes away. <laughs> yeah, mine's uh, the Space Needle in Seattle, where the floor is see through. Uh-huh. I don't do well with heights. I right. uh, a lady walked past me and bumped me, and it made me jump because mm-hmm. I was standing next to the glass area, and I almost oh. I had started to have like a little bit of a panic attack, and I'm like, I'm completely yep. safe there. Other people are having mm-hmm. a great time walking out on the glass glass floor. I yeah. no hard pass, hard pass. Yeah, yeah. That's not for I me. That. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that that's kind of like a borderline. That's a real fear heights yep. and, and also yep. recreational at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any recommendations for anyone who wants to get into recreational fear, but maybe they're a little more apprehensive things that they can um, maybe start out with or, or um, try to ease their, ease their fear a little bit. Yeah. So my, my own question would be, why would I even want to do that? <laughs> yeah. And my answer to the question would be, that we're finding more and more positive effects that mm-hmm. it actually turns out to to have positive effects, which is um, maybe a little bit surprising because so much previous, especially horror research, has focused on negative effects. Yeah, definitely. But I think that yeah, especially all of that you know media psychological research from the eighties that was very interested in looking at how everybody had traumatic experiences with watching horror movies when they were eleven or. Uh, but we're finding that there are positive effects and they probably vastly outweigh the negative effects. So I would suggest that people might challenge themselves to uh, engage playfully with fear. Uh, but it really, I think it's a process of introspection. You know, you have to ask yourself, how much can I handle? Where Where is my sweet spot? Um, and so for somebody who has never seen a horror movie you don't want to go straight to hereditary or oh no oh no (laughs) so maybe for somebody like that maybe begin with a kid's horror movie like transylvania or hotel transylvania or you know an animated film that is a little scary but also not too much uh roller coasters aren't for everybody but that's that's maybe also a place to start um finding something to read i mean some people uh picture is a little bit murky here, but some people think horror movies are way scarier than books, but there are also many people who find that books get them in a way that movies couldn't. Maybe find some old stuff so that you get that psychological distance that comes with time. Watch an old slasher movie where they, you know, dress funny and speak funny. Uh, so so th- those would be maybe a couple of uh, recommendations. Awesome. Um, what are you looking forward to for the future of the recreational fear lab? Um, well, we have some, well, there's so much uh, that I'm excited about. We're, we're beginning to delve into recreational fear as a protective influence against the development of anxiety disorder. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that's I think that's a really intriguing line of inquiry, um, because there is some evidence that uh, that you know we have this pandemic of mental health problems among young people in the West with depression and anxiety and things like that, and and, and some people are beginning to suggest that maybe the problem is that kids nowadays don't get to play with fear as much as we did back in the eighties or whatever. Because of you know overprotective parenting or um, 
And, and so maybe that's a problem because if they don't get to play with fear, if they aren't chased by somebody pretending to be a monster or they don't get to read scary stories or eventually scary movies, they won't have a very good sense of what their body does under stress, what it means when the heart starts hammering or when you have butterflies in your stomach. That's not necessarily indicative of a panic attack. That could be just a very normal stress response to a mildly frightening situation. And they also don't get a chance to practice those emotion regulation strategies we talked about before. So it's really a matter of investigating whether recreational fear, including horror, might function as a kind of exposure therapy, as a way in which you can playfully um, train yourself to engage with negative stimuli and uh, improve your ability to regulate your own emotions. Um, so that I, I think that that's interesting. And then there is a brand new study that we're currently putting together with uh, new collaborators who are doctors at the university hospital, where we're trying to see if recreational fear might um, function as a non-medical intervention for uh, low-grade chronic inflammation, which is a fancy way of asking whether you can scare uh, inflammation out of somebody. Um, it could be it could be that when people go to a haunted house to watch a horror movie, they kind of zap the immune system and um, and and kind of optimize it, which could be a way to combat inflammation. Oh, wow. So we don't know yet, and that's so, so that's going to be fun too. This is so cool. There's like really interesting things, um, especially mm. the anxiety that. Yeah. I mean, I I know there's no data behind it, but it it makes sense to me. Um, wow. Um, yeah, it's there's no kind of empirical data, but but I've come across a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence. Uh, people who tell me that they almost self-medicate. Um, people who struggle with anxiety, they you know they walk around in a sort of mist of free-floating bad feelings that don't have a clear origin and that that they don't have any control over. But then when they go to a haunted house or they watch a horror movie. Um, they know exactly what is causing their heart to race and what is giving them butterflies in the stomach. And they have full control. They can leave, they can switch off the film, whatever. So for them, it's a it's like a controllable dose of of uh, negative emotion that they can sort of play with. And we did we did actually do one study in the haunted house where we wanted to see if we could identify different kinds of horror fans and whether people might have different motives for seeking out horror and get different things out of it and we found three different kinds of horror fans the adrenaline junkie who is in it for you know the kick the arousal the white knuckler who also enjoys horror but sees it as more of a kind of personal challenge in keeping fear at a tolerable level and who feels that they learn something about themselves and develop as a person from uh, seeking out horror and then the, uh, an intriguing third kind that we call call the dark coper. Um, very often somebody who uses scary stories to deal with a world that they perceive to be scary. Often somebody who might have anxiety or depression and who uses scary entertainment to kind of treat that or make it manageable. So, so, so there is sort of not rock solid evidence, but things that point in the direction that suggest that, yeah, it could be that maybe, this is going to sound like a joke, but maybe in the future your doctor is going to prescribe a couple of horror movies to treat whatever <laughs> mental health problem you're struggling with. I would definitely be on board for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just explains why I have my stuff together. I really yeah. don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we all have. Yeah. Anyway, um, is yeah. there any anything else that we didn't touch on that you would really love to share? Um, no, I think, I think we touched on everything. I mean, the, the red thread here for me is maybe how now that we're beginning to create the science out of recreational fear and approach horror more kind of empirically, we really are finding a lot of evidence to support this idea that horror is a good thing. You know, the, the world with horror in it is maybe paradoxically a better world than one without horror. And I think that stands in, in contrast to 
um, certain certain media discourses or the way people used to think about horror as something right. that was you know morally problematic and psychologically harmful and mm -hmm. aesthetically uninteresting. That is not the case. I agree with you there. I agree with you there. I think horror is a unique genre as well. It can tell stories that you couldn't tell in other genres because yeah. there are no limitations. You can you can talk about all kinds of uncomfortable subjects in an entertaining way to get your message out using horror. Yeah. I think one of my own favorite examples of that would be uh, Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, um, which goes some very dark places. Uh, but it's so well told, such engaging characters. And it really is the kind of horror story that forces you to familiarize yourself with some of the really dark registers of the human emotional spectrum. And it's not always very pleasant, but I think it's valuable. I mean, I think it's important that we don't pretend that we only have positive emotions and that everything is rosy because everybody at some point is going to face loss and grief and pain and horror. And so why not get a little bit of experience with, with those emotions through, you know, entertainment literature. Yeah. I, th I think happily ever after does more damage to us than horror because it's an un unobtainable goal. Mm, we can never be happily ever after. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your, your day to talk to me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'll put links to the Recreational Fear Lab and your work in on my website so people can find you. Um, thank you again. I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. That was our very first interview with Matthias Clayson of the Recreational Fear Lab. Um, this is M.A. in post. If the audio sounds a little different, it's because I am on vacation right now recording this. Please check out the Recreational Fear Lab on their website at fear.au.dk. They're also on Instagram and Twitter at RecFearLab. You can find Mateus on Twitter and Instagram as well, so search for him. I highly recommend you check out his work, the books that he, have, he has written, and the studies that have been published. All of this information will, is included on our website at horrorstudyhall.com. Follow us on social media at Horror Study Hall. You can also follow us on YouTube under Horror Study Hall. Please rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps the podcast reach a, a wider audience, and we would really appreciate your help there. You can also email me at amateurhorror101 at gmail.com and stay spooky, my friends. Thanks for listening. <laughs>